Alrighty, welcome back. Finally had time to record a video for today. So snuck away, have some time to record a video, and I wanted to do one that covers a few different things. First of all, I created some social media. I created a email address specifically for this YouTube channel, as well as a Twitter handle specifically for this channel. And the reasons why, I'm going to be gone most of next week, so I won't have a video out midweek like I typically have. And I was just thinking, man, I wish there was a way that if something comes up and I'm not able to record a video, I could like tweet it out to everyone and let them know. And YouTube doesn't really have a good way of doing that, especially if you have a low amount of subscribers like I do. You can't even use the community features to launch questions and, and things in your YouTube stream. So I'm going to throw up the, the Twitter and the Gmail there. The Gmail, you can use that to, to ask me different questions that are more long form that you don't really want to have public in the YouTube comments or whatever. You can email me for any reason there. The uh, Twitter as well, you can follow me there. I don't plan on doing way too many tweets. It's mostly going to be just about this YouTube channel or anything that I find relevant to it. So any announcements or changes to it or anything like that, if you're interested in following it there. Other than that, I wanted to go over a few different things in this video. So the first thing I wanted to do was give you an update, just a short update for what's happened this week. I know I had a video out last Wednesday, so I'll just be talking about what's happened in between then. And then I wanted to go over the title of this video, Why Dividend Growth Investing. Now, this is one I want to cover a lot of the reasons that I choose dividend growth investing over traditional investing, which traditional, I believe, is just growth investing. So I'm going to go over that and, and talk about that. And then the last thing is I wanted to go over the Spotify and Apple debacle that's going on right now. So if you haven't heard, Spotify launched a big complaint against Apple of what they believe are unfair business practices that are making it so that they can't compete with Apple. And they launched that complaint to European regulators in hopes that Europe will help Spotify out. And I'm going to be talking about that, just giving my opinion on it. Uh, and yeah, so first thing, I wanted to do the update. So I'll go ahead and do that now. So if I go in the week view here, we're up $567, 1.83%. That's a little bit lower than S&P 500, but this portfolio, again, is... I, I think considerably less risky. 20% of it is in treasury bonds. So it's quite a bit less risk. But if we look at earned dividends, in my last video on Wednesday, it was at like $3. Now it's at $29. So pretty good amount of dividends earned there for a one week period. Then if I go to the one month period, look at that, earned dividends, still over 100 bucks. So I'm happy to see that the, the earned dividends right here for the one month period is constantly hovering over $100. So the more I can continually keep that above 100 bucks, the more my paid dividends are gonna be over $100 when I go to here. So I need to get this over the $100 mark and continually grow this, this amount. This is a big indicator here. So other than that, if I look at activity here, we had right here, some of these dividend payments were paid on Wednesday, but it was only like $9. Then what happened was a few more companies paid Thursday and Friday, and it bumped it up to $15.41, which made it go and do the trading algorithm. And that purchased Boeing and a few treasury ETFs, which is pretty cool to see because I didn't do anything with this. There's no interaction from me. This is just my portfolio paying me money, and then that money being used to purchase underweight securities, which Boeing became underweight when it dropped 15% this week, this week. So that's, you know, it's a little amount of money, but I still think it's awesome to see this cycle happen over and over constantly, especially without me having to do anything for it to happen. And I prefer this way where this money can be allocated to different companies more than I prefer a traditional drip system where it has to be reinvested into the same holdings that pay it. So I really like the way that this works to keep your portfolio in balance. But that's pretty much it for this week. I wanted to jump in to the bigger subject, and that is traditional investing, which is the most popular style of investing, which is putting your money into passive index funds versus dividend growth investing. To preface this, here's a huge preface, big disclaimer. If you're doing investing at all, you're way ahead of most people. So don't get too strung up on the details. What I'm doing is just giving you my opinion of why I'm choosing a dividend portfolio that is a dividend growth portfolio specifically over the passive index fund. Because if you go most places online, 
all you're going to be hearing is one side. You're going to be hearing the opinion that passive index investing is the only way to invest and there's really no other realistic way to do it, which I don't agree with. So I'm going to just be giving you my opinion. So to just um, take a step back, I wanted to go over and just do a, a quick recap of each type of investing so you know what I'm actually comparing. First, traditional growth investing, and I'm going to call it traditional growth because when I say dividend growth, it can get confusing. So I'm, instead of just calling it growth investing, I'm going to call it traditional growth. So traditional growth investing is a type of investing that focuses on capital appreciation. Capital appreciation is when the share price of a company increases. So you go to any company and I can take, I'll take uh, Netflix. They have their market cap and with capital appreciation, with growth investing, you're looking to buy it at this market cap and hope that that increases, right? That is the goal of traditional growth investing. And it has, this has been the most popular type of investing for at least the past decade. So since the recession, most people have been putting their money in index funds and watching that grow. And it's done very well. Uh, it, this type of investing has done very well. The only concern I have about it is that we haven't really seen how this amount of massive amounts of money in index funds will perform in a, in a bear market or in another recession because it's largely been done post the 2009 recession. Now compare this type of investing where you look for capital appreciation to dividend growth. Dividend growth is different because instead of looking at the, the price of the share, you're looking at the payment of the dividend. So the growth in dividend growth investing, let me give Dominion Energy. This is one that I just highlighted as one of my three conviction picks, I guess was the name of it. But D Dominion Energy has, has a long standing dividend history. So this is their total dis dividend history since when they started paying them. And you can see this is the dividend growth, different than capital appreciation. If I go over here, this is their capital appreciation, right? All over the place. Sometimes it dips down like it did in during the recession, di dips down right here, dips down right here. Capital appreciation, this is what you'd be looking for with that. Dividend growth, this is what you'd be looking for right here. Now that is the primary differences. Essentially, the, the goal with traditional growth is looking for capital appreciation. The goal with dividend growth is looking for an ever growing income stream. This is income right here. You can see that it's growing. That's what you look for in all of your holdings. You want to buy holdings that they continue to grow your income stream. Uh, so huge differences there. Now, once you say, if you ever say that you're doing focusing on dividends or doing dividend growth investing, you're going to hear a lot of the same things. You're going to hear that you should only focus on total return. Nothing else really matters beyond that. Dividends aren't tax efficient. Uh, you know, it's basic index investing. Uh, you know, dividend investing, they can come, they can cut their dividends, right? Uh, you, you'll hear that the stock price is lowered when a dividend's paid. So what's even the point of it? And you're missing out on great growth companies when you only focus on dividend ones, right? So that is what you're going to be hearing over and over again. I'm going to, instead of go through line by line and address all of those, what I want to do is just point out the reasons I like dividend growth. And, and I just think that they for me, they, they have a bigger weight. They, uh, the reasons that I like dividend growth outweigh all those little objections. So the first one is cash flow. Passive income is the name of the game. It's literally the title of my portfolio. What I'm building this portfolio centered around is creating an ever-growing stream of passive income. And why is income important? I believe it's extremely important. I don't like buying something that doesn't provide income because I believe it's, it's similar to just like buying gold. It's like buying, buying something that can go up in value, but in the meantime, it's not doing much for you. And then when it does go up in value, to get anything from it, you have to start chipping away little pieces of that gold and selling it. And that's what I believe it's similar to when you're investing in index funds. They do pay some, in, they do pay some income, but very, very little. Basically what you're looking for is a thing that you're buying now to hopefully be worth more later. I do not prefer that at all compared to having a constant and ever-growing stream of income. So take a look at this graph. When I look at this, 
This is the most important thing to me. Every single month that my passive income goes up, it's less that I'm dependent on my active income. It means more freedom. It means more it means less dependency on living in the rat race. Now, I can look at this and I can start averaging these out like I have quarterly here. When I look and say in a, you know, on a 3-month basis I'm earning this much, I can actually literally start to say, "Hey, my my portfolio is generating enough income now." that I, don't, I can have my Comcast bill covered for the rest of my life. That's less dependency on me having to pay for that. Then it gets to the point where I can say, hey, my utilities can be covered for the rest of my life. I wanna to get to the point where all of my basic necessities are completely covered for the rest of my life. And I can do that through passive income. If you're investing in just index funds, you're, you don't have any kind of indicator for that. It's very difficult to tell how much you're actually, how much progress you're actually making and becoming less dependent on your primary income. So passive income is extremely important to me. I like the compounding aspect of it. I like the idea of having an ever-growing stream of income that's different from what I'm constantly working for during the day. There's mathematical reasons. There's psychological reasons. There's a lot of different reasons I prefer cash flow over I do the more speculative way of investing where you just hope that something increases in value later down the road. So cash flow is reason number one that I prefer my dividend growth portfolio over a basic index investing strategy, a basic traditional growth investing strategy. The second reason is the simplicity of the framework. Again, a lot of this is psychological. So even if you're arguing for a total return argument, people are emotional. And if you can invest in a way that helps you keep your emotions bridled so that you make better decisions, that is a good way to invest. The simplicity of a dividend growth investing framework helps me keep my emotions out of it and keep keeps logic and a, a planned strategy is what's in control. So if I look at all my companies, I have specific logical reasons for buying them, and I have specific rules for selling them. The reasons that I buy them is if they have long dividend growth histories. You can look at that right here for a Dominion history. Long dividend growth histories. If they have a good starting yield, doesn't have to be great, but a decent starting yield. If they're companies that have products that are going to be relevant in five to 10 years, that's the actual quantitative or qualitative research you have to do on it. And so there's a couple of different aspects I look at when buying them, which is all pretty simple. It's basically all about the dividend. And then you look at some other things that make sure that it, it's not ruled out for other reasons. The reasons that you sell them are even more simple. You sell companies if they cut or slash their dividend. That's it. That's when you sell a company. So the simplicity of this framework makes it so that you can easily create a pretty decent portfolio, but more importantly, you can keep your head on straight when the market's going nuts because you can actually have a good indicator of which companies are actually struggling or not. If you look at the S&P 500, there was a time when many companies were struggling and many weren't, but people sold all of them because they could they had no way to differentiate between which ones were actually struggling or not. And that's when emotions come into play. They sold companies like Visa that weren't even struggling during 09, but they sold them just out of concerns. If you're investing in capital appreciation, you don't have the same framework of that of mind. The research on reading 10Ks, on reading all these income reports, on doing all this due diligence on every single stock that you're buying and the ever-changing market conditions is extremely tiring. It's extremely complex. I love the simplicity of this portfolio and the, what, the, the indicators that I look, I believe, are far more simple, and simple things are easier to wrap your head around, and they make it so that I believe you'll be a less emotional investor in the market, which I think is a good thing. The last reason that I'll highlight is predictability. Now, this top number of market gains is totally unpredictable. I put my money in, and we could have had a recession right? We could have had some war with another country or something gone really bad. And this number, instead of being plus 2,500, could be negative 2,500. I have no idea. What I do know is if the companies are doing okay, this number below is always going to go up. The earned dividends will continually go up and it will go up at an accelerated rate. That is what I like about it. This, uh, this predictability of it. 
capital appreciation in my mind is far less predictable than dividend income. Dividend income is, is an is a actual thing that you can look at, and in my mind, it's far more, more far more predictable. Let's take an example of that. What looks more predictable to you? This graph or this one right below it? This one still has a, a pretty good, so it's followed this graph, which is exactly what it should do. If your dividends are constantly going up, the yield's constantly going to go up, which people buy, which brings the yield back down, so on and so forth. So as this graph goes up, this one should follow. But you can see there's times where this one has been just predictable as can be. Just no problems right here. Look at this. Right through 2009, not a single issue. Just as predictable and steady as could be where this one went down. If, if you cut off this last half of the graph right here from 2009 onwards, you would say, wow, this really isn't all that predictable. Well, I don't know which way it's going to go. It could go up or down. If you looked at this graph, you'd say there's no point in this where it was unpredictable. I love the predictability of a dividend growth investing strategy. I think it... I think it makes it much easier for you to wrap your head around what's going to happen in the future. And all of these things combined, I think make for an easier portfolio for me to maintain, for me to actually make money with, and for me to, to stay cool when the market turns bad. And it's eventually gonna turn bad. It's not gonna go up like this forever like it has for the past 10 years. So to summarize, we have the three reasons why. First of all, cash flow, which is actual passive income. Index investing is not passive income. It's passive investing, but there's no income part of it. I like the income part of it. The second reason why is the simplicity of the framework, knowing exactly when I'm going to buy a company, exactly when I'm going to sell it. Very simple, easy indicators to wrap your head around. And then the third reason is the predictability of it. I have, I have charts that bring me some kind of predictability with it. I can see actual trends that I can follow and I can see actual dividend histories that I can follow. So those are three of my biggest reasons why I prefer this over index investing. I know that index investing is very popular. I'm not bashing on that strategy. People will have just, just like I have these reasons why I prefer dividend growth. Everybody has their reasons why they prefer their strategy. So I'm sure the people that prefer index investing, they have all of their reasons as well. So I'm not saying that they're bad. And like I said, to preface this, no, it's not like if you're doing one of these over the other, that one is necessarily better than the other. I think what one's best is which one is going to make you keep your cool and keep invested and follow the rules that you laid out before. That's going to be the best strategy for you. So if that's passive index investing, then go ahead and do that strategy. If it's dividend in income investing, then, then go ahead and do that strategy. Now, moving on from that, I wanted to go over and address some of the news that happened this week. So, well, let me go to, first of all, let me go to Spotify's complaint here. They have this like for the record com, for the record page here. And then there's the CEO of Spotify. So before I'll say that I'm, a, uh, I'm American, so I'm coming at this from an American perspective. I know Spotify is a Swedish company. So have, having that said, I might have some innate biases here, but I wanted to give my opinion on this. Uh, I read through both his complaint and, and Apple's, and I think this ties in a lot to what Elizabeth Warren was trying to do. And one of the major points I said that I, that I don't like about what Elizabeth Warren is trying to do by making it so that a company that creates a platform can't be a participant in that platform, I think a huge problem with that is that it is going to hamper our companies tremendously. Because some of the companies that have created that platform are amazing companies with some of our smartest people. So they them not being able to even participate on it is like preventing our brightest and smartest people from creating other services. And I don't think that's a good thing. And I said that I think it would make it harder for us to compete with other people like Europe, like India and China. So I don't like the idea of hampering our own companies. Now, the CEO, Daniel here, the CEO of Spotify, seems to agree with Elizabeth Warren. And this is exactly the type of thing that I was highlighting. Other places are going to use this type of regulations to try to inhibit our ability to compete. So if you look at their comp complaint, it's pretty simple. They say, first apps should be able to compete fairly on their merits and not based on who owns the app store. We should all be subject to the same fair set of rules and restrictions, including Apple Music. Second, consumers should have a real choice of payment systems and not be locked in or forced to use systems with discrimi discriminatory tariffs such as Apple's. Finally, 
App stores should not be allowed to control the communications between services and users, including placing unfair restrictions on marketing promotions that benefit customers. So obviously he goes into more detail on this, but it's the same basic idea that Apple, since they own the app store, they shouldn't be able to really write any rules they want for the app store. He's not trying to just say that they can't be a participant, but he's wanting to literally write the rules of Apple's app store saying, we want to communicate with your customers, your, uh, your customer base, your iPhone users, how we want to communicate with them. We want to be able to use whatever payment solutions we want, not yours that you've tested and vetted and said that's approved for this platform. We want to use our own alternative payment solution. So those are rule changes to Apple's own app store. I don't agree with that at all. App, the reason that app, the app store is so popular and the reason, honestly, the reason that a lot of people buy iPhones is because of how well Apple has controlled and vetted the apps that get onto their app store. So I work a lot with technology and I've pushed apps to the app store uh, hundreds of times. I had one app just get denied three times this week because of tiny little things that Apple uh, that broke some kind of rule of Apple. They're extremely thorough in their vetting process of, of what goes on the App Store. That's a huge pain for developers, and Spotify has even complained about that, saying that Apple has like intentionally delayed their app. I don't buy that at all. I've had my app, I have had apps that I've created get delayed so many times, and I'm uh, completely, you know, nothing compared to Spotify. So the, the company I work for and the apps that we push are nothing compared to Spotify. So they they are slow and deliberate and thorough with every single app that goes on that app store. Um, on, in contrast, if you look at Google's app store, I, I can push things to that all day long. It's, I've, I don't think I've ever had an app denied from it, literally ever. So uh, anyway, I, I think that a lot of this, the idea of changing the, the having being able to legislate and say, Apple, you can't run your app store the way that you want is a terrible thing to do. The quality of their app store is part of the reason why people buy into the iPhone ecosystem. They don't want to do, uh, deal with faulty apps. They don't want to deal with spammy communications. They buy into the app store because they like the way that Apple vets the apps. So I think I think it's, it's part of the whole value of Apple is the way that they vet their app store. So I don't like this complaint to begin with. Um, Apple went through and addressed a lot of the complaints they have. So. So Apple requires that Spotify and other digital services pay a 30% tax on purchases made through Apple's payment system. It's, it's more of just a fee. I mean, they charge 30% because you're benefiting from using their app store. So this is kind of, I think it's kind of ridiculous to me. If you really go through and look at all of Spotify's complaints, from my perspective, they're pretty much saying that they want to have access to Apple's app store that Apple has spent billions of dollars investing in and creating it over the decades that have put tremendous effort in validating and mating, making it what I believe is literally the highest quality app store anywhere in existence. And they want to have access to, to the distribution, the validation, all of that from Apple. And they don't want to have to pay the 30% fee that Apple charges to do it through digital goods. And then when Apple says, well, you don't have to pay that fee, you can have people sign up on your website and they can still use the app and they just, just log in. I actually looked at this and that's exactly what Netflix is doing. They're having people sign up on their website and then they're logging in. And I actually went ahead and I downloaded the Netflix app just to ensure this because their complaint seems very similar to the process of what Netflix is doing. And Netflix is a direct competitor with Apple. Apple's coming out with a streaming service. So Netflix is fine working with the rules that Apple has laid out. Spotify wants to change the rules that Apple has laid out. They don't want to pay the 30% fee. And when Apple says, well, there's another way to do it, they don't want to do that either. They want to be able to allow for people to sign up using Apple's platform in their store and not have to pay Apple a dime to do it. And I think that that is, is a, pretty, uh, a pretty ridiculous thing to ask. Now. Apple issued their own response and it was pretty fiery. I mean, Apple is is usually tempered as a company, even when they have things kind of blow up or things happen or large criticisms to them. They always issued just kind of this very corporate response. This one was not not like that. So one of the complaints that Spotify brought up was that 
their laws are anti-competitive and harmful to other businesses, right? They're keeping the small guy down. Apple's using their big platform to keep the small guy down. In this paragraph, Apple illustrates their counter argument to that. 11 years ago, Apple Store brought the same passion for creativity to mobile apps in the decades since. The App Store has helped create many millions of jobs, generated more than $120 billion for developers, and created new industries through businesses started and grown entirely in the App Store ecosystem. So it's hard to argue that they're a job killer when they can cite all these sources of how many hundreds of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of jobs have been created and people work entirely based off of their store. And, you know, $120 billion for developers have been paid out so far. So that's Apple addressing that. At its core, the App Store is a safe, secure platform where users can have faith in the apps they discover and transactions they make. I think this is absolutely key. So that's this is the biggest problem I have with what Spotify is asking. Spotify is saying, you can't be restrictive with your platform. Apple's all about restriction. That's openly what they do. They restrict, they restrict everything that they do because it, when they have control over it, they can control the quality of it. So a lot of people find that frustrating and they go to... Uh, Google products, which is totally fine, but a lot of people are just the opposite and they like saying I'd rather have Apple restrict all of this restrict all these third-party developers So they can't do weird things with my phone But instead they can only develop apps in the way that Apple wants them to, to interact with your phone So this is the biggest thing is Apple's reputation is based off of making their store Secure and safe and if you go and erase all the rules that can do that I don't believe that they'll be able to continue doing that they say that's how it should be. We want more businesses to thrive, including ones that compete with some aspects of our business because they drive us to do better, right? What Spotify is demanding is something very different. After using the App Store for years to dramatically grow their business, Spotify seeks to keep all the benefits of the App Store ecosystem, including substantial revenue that they draw from the App Store's customers, without making any contributions to the marketplace. At the same time, they, distrib they distribute music you love while making ever smaller um, contributions to the artists, musicians, and songwriters who create it, even going so far as to take these creators to court. So Apple's throwing out some shade there. They pretty much said that, that Spotify has come, put their app onto their app store, Apple's, and distributed it using Apple's entire marketplace. They're, they're huge networks of hundreds of millions of customers. And, at, and Spotify has been a huge beneficiary of that, and they don't want to pay a dime for it, which is true. Then Apple goes so far to bring out the criticism of their own of how Spotify is running their business, saying that they're underpaying songwriters and they're going so far to take these creators to court, which I can see some people are saying that that's not really relevant at all. I think it is pretty relevant because Spotify is in the same situation that they're arguing against. They run their own platform, a music platform, that artists have to get onto if they want their music distributed to a huge portion of consumers and Spotify does everything they can to pay those artists as low as possible, right? And Spotify has their own rules and Spotify has their own things that compete with those artists. So they're, they're in this weird situation where they're asking for things that they can bring up criticism against themselves. So they go on and say Spotify can determine their own business model, but they left out all these different things. And Apple pretty much lays out everything that they've done to help Spotify. So Spotify, part of their claim was that like Apple's really, you know, they they have it out for us. They're against us. They're not helping us. Apple points out that they've helped them with CarPlay, help them with Apple Watch app. That's one of the, the number one Apple Watch music category. Uh, they go on. They say, you know, Spotify saying that Apple is is being mean and charging all these developers and all these people tons of money in their app store. Apple says that 84% of the apps in the App Store pay nothing to Apple when they're downloaded to use. That's not discrimination. Apps that are free to you aren't charged by Apple. Apps that earn revenue exclusively through advertising, like some of your favorite free games, aren't charged by Apple. Apple business or app business transactions where users sign in, up, or purchase digital goods outside apps aren't charged by Apple. Selling physical goods, including ride. Oh, this is one of the things that Spotify also brought up. They said it was unfair that they're getting charged, but Uber and Grubhub and all these different companies aren't getting charged. And Apple says selling physical go goods, including ride hailing and food delivery services, to name a few, aren't charged by Apple. So the only 
thing that Apple requires with digital goods and services purchased inside the app using the secure in-app purchase system. As Spotify points out, that revenue share is 30% for the first year for the annual subscription, but they left out that it drops to 15% in the years after. So this again is how they charge every company. So Apple has been doing this with Netflix. And Netflix did the same thing where they, they made it so you can't sign up through iOS devices. You have to sign up on their website. They do it to Amazon. And Amazon makes it so when you buy Kindle books, you have to do it online rather than through their through their app store. So Apple is fine hosting this platform, but they're saying if you're going to do this one type of digital purchase on our platform, we want a cut of it, right? To be able to, that's the investment. They created the platform and they want a return on their investment. So they go on with it and and they describe their love for music and all this type of thing. Now, there's arguments on both sides. I can see from Spotify how they believe that it's unfair. I mean, they have this behemoth of a competitor, Apple, that is deciding that they're really wanting to get in a streaming game like Spotify has been doing. But Apple has, they have the resources, they have the talent, they have an incredible amount of money and, and leverage and power. And that's got to be extremely intimidating for Spotify. So when Spotify talks about having them having a competitive advantage, Apple certainly does. The difference that I agree with is that that competitive advantage is a legal, illegal thing to have. Companies have competitive advantages to each other. It's not the government's role to say this company has a competitive advantage, so we need to get rid of that competitive advantage. Every company tries, that's what a moat is. Every company tries to create a moat so that they have something that helps them compete in the marketplace. If you look at Coca-Cola, try competing against Coca-Cola. Good luck with that. You could go to the government and ask for help with that, but Coca-Cola has contracts with like over half the major food chains, half the, the restaurants, exclusive contracts. You can only sell their drinks in them with movie chains and with everything else they can. They try their hardest to make it so nobody can get into that industry. Nothing about that is illegal. That's just that's just business. That how That's how it works. And regardless of this type of thing happening forever, other companies have been able to compete. So even with these big temp, these big American tech companies, there have been companies, like I said, the lifespan is shorter than most people think, and there have been new companies coming up, coming up. I think it would be a very sad thing to make it so that Apple cannot compete with music because they own the App Store, or that they have to choose between the two. Apple was the inventor of the iPod. They've literally been music enthusiasts for, for decades. So saying this company that obviously has an interest in music and had an interest in music even before Spotify, that they can't get into the streaming game or they can't advertise it because they would be a participant in their own marketplace, I think would be a very, very sad thing. So I'm hoping the e-regulators don't 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 just say Apple you can't sell your own music on it or you have to give Spotify this exemption where they don't pay a fee. Spotify has been doing just fine. I think Apple will take a lot of uh, customers, but that's going to happen regardless of of what they do. So anyway, I want to hear your guys' thoughts on that. I think that this all ties back into what Elizabeth Warren is doing. Uh, it's a that's a tricky situation. There's opinions on both sides. I definitely think that Apple should be able to compete and create their own music service, and it should be judged on their merits. So as far as I can tell, they're not doing anything to specifically damage Spotify. They're just treating Spotify with the same rules that they treat everybody else. So anyway, well, I'll leave you guys with that. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Uh, remember to follow me on the Twitter, subscribe to me on YouTube, and I'll let you guys know what's going on. We'll see you guys later.